1 Samuel chapter 4, we'll begin reading in verse 15. The Bible says this, Now Eli was ninety and eight years old, and his eyes were dim that he could not see. And the man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army. And he said, What is there done, my son? And the messenger answered and said, Israel is fled before the Philistines, and there hath been also a great slaughter among the people. And thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. And it came to pass, when he made mention of the ark of God, that he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck brake, and he died, for he was an old man and heavy, and he had judged Israel forty years. And his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child, near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken, and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of the death of her death, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered not, uh, neither did she regard it. Uh, and she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank you, Lord, that you are so good. And Lord, you are worthy to be praised for all you've done. God, we thank you for the good singing, the good prayer time. Lord, again, the privilege of being in the house of God tonight. So, Father, I pray that you'd sit down amongst us. You'd meet every need of every heart. God, I pray that, Lord, we'd yield ourselves as instruments into thy hand. And God, I pray that you'd be glorified from this service. Uh, Send revival. Help us tonight. Uh, and, Lord, we'll not fail to bless you and praise you for it. Uh, Lord, we're needy people. And, God, we're uh, a people living in a day and age of wickedness. And, God, we need some help and some strength uh, to keep on keeping on for God. Uh, and God, I pray you'd help us tonight uh, to do that very thing. Bless as only you can. Uh, Lord, thank you for these 30 years that you've used this unworthy vessel. Uh, Father, we bless you and give you the praise and the honor for it. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for being so good. Have your will and way now, for it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Uh, and amen. We find here uh, one of the most sobering texts in all the Old Testament. Uh, when the ark of God was taken away from God's people uh, and given it into the hands of the Philistines. Uh, we know the ark of God uh, was to lead God's people and was to lead their armies to battle. And the ark of God uh, represented the presence and power of God. Uh, we know the ark of God, my dear friends, uh, uh, contained the very things that God had used in Israel's lives, the original uh, tablets or the second set of tablets the original ones uh, Moses broke on the golden calf that uh, the children of Israel had built uh, but uh, uh, the commandments that God had written with his own finger were in the ark of God uh, we know that a pot of manna was in the ark of God to show uh, that for 40 years God had sustained them and met their needs in the wilderness uh, and we know uh, my dear friends that the rod which budded which proved that Aaron's uh, uh, generations were to be the priest line that served the temple of God uh, was all in the ark of God uh, it showed uh, everything that Israel needed God's word God's ability to sustain them uh, and God's ability to minister unto them was all inside the ark uh, the ark pictures the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and can I say he's all we need uh, and friends as long as he goes before us uh, there is no one that can overcome or defeat us uh, the problem is, is when we take for granted him. And I want to show you some things in this text. And we'll get to the message. I want you to notice, first of all, the routine of Israel. Look at verse number four. 
It says, So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the ark of the covenant of God. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, uh, Oh, Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth rang again. Uh, and when the Philistines heard uh, the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? Uh, and they understood uh, uh, that the ark of the Lord was coming to the camp. Uh, notice that they'd got very routine. See, if we had time, we'd go back a couple chapters and show you Hophni and Phinehas were not of uh, 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 the lineage that God ordained to take care of the ark. Uh, and they offered up strange fire before the Lord. Uh, uh, they were out of the will of God and they uh, offered up uh, a sacrifice that was not pleasing unto God. They were to have nothing to do with the ark. Uh, they're in control of the ark. Uh, and now uh, all of Israel serving God the way they want to serve God uh, and not seeking God the way that he set forth. Uh, uh, but now they're in trouble. The Philistines have come uh, and set themselves in a raid of battle. Uh, and here comes Israel. Well, let's just go get the ark. Uh, and they got the ark. Uh, and they thought, all right, we'll win now. And they're just going through routine. Can I say, week in and week out, we come to church. No, oh, the enemy has set himself in a raid against us. Uh, but oh, we think all we got to do is get to church. Oh, it's got to happen. The Bible's got to be open. And folks will shout glory to God. And we'll sing glory to God. But we have no power because we just go through the motions. Can I say you can sing the songs and every note be in harmony? Can I say every song, the words can glorify God? Can I say you can stand and preach and every word spoken will be truth? But if it don't have the power of God, it's all in vain. Amen. You can come to church, and it's right to come to church. The Bible teaches not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. You can come to church. You can look right. You can be right and all those things. But if you just come out of habit or routine, or you come because you think you're expected to be here, and you don't come seeking God and coming to put him first, friends, it's all in vain. And I say a lot of folks come to church out of routine. It's a habit. That's what we do. We go to church. And with our lips we do honor him, but our heart is far from him. We see the routine. I want you to notice the rampage. Look in verse number 10. And the Philistines fought. Now in verse number 6, when they heard that the camp was, uh, the ark was in the camp, verse 7, they were afraid. Because they knew the history of the ark. But in verse number 10, look what happens. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten, and they fled every man to his tent, and there was a very great slaughter, for there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. You see, there was a leader of the Philistines, in verse 9, says, What are you afraid of? Let's go fight. And can I say, you better have a lot more than huffing and puffing when the fight gets on. Because you might blow, and the house might not come down. So I want to say something about the Philistines and the enemies of God. They just keep coming and keep coming and keep coming and all the hopes that one day you're just going through the routine. Yeah. I want you to notice the relaxing in verse 13. Now don't get all bogged down. This thing's going somewhere. Sure. It's a lot better than 30 years ago. It was, it was going somewhere that night too, but it wasn't in the same direction we're going to go tonight. Look at verse 13. It says, And when he came low, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching. Now, you have to understand, Eli was the man of God. Can I say the man of God, and he judged Israel for 40 years. The man of God's place was not sitting up on a hillside relaxing, wondering what's going on down at the battle. Can I say the man of God was to lead the ark of God before the battle? He's not where he's supposed to be. Can I say it had been that way for a long time because he let his sons be in control of the ark. They weren't ordained of God to be there. 
He's relaxing. Can I say, all you got to do is let up a little bit. Just relax. I find it very disturbing that when he realized he relaxed, it was too late. When the messenger comes and tells him his two sons are dead and that, you know, Israel's on, uh, fleeting and, you know, 30,000 men have died, that didn't affect him too much. But when he heard the ark was gone, that's when he fell and broke his neck. Why did he fall? Because he's leaning. He's really relaxed. We see the relaxing. Can I say there's a lot of folks that relax when it comes to things of God. You wouldn't believe over the years how many times I've said, well, Brother Doug, if you just let up a little bit. Well, I see what happens when you let up. Brother Doug, if you just wasn't so strong on that point, I see what happens when you're not strong. Brother Doug, what's wrong with it? If you've got to ask if there's something wrong with it, most time there is. Hmm. Now notice the reality. Look at verse 21. This poor woman about ready to have a child. She finds out she's a widow. She also finds out her father-in-law's dead. She knows that now she has nobody to take care of her. Bible says she had a she had the baby in verse 20 and she did she didn't even regard it. She didn't hold it, she didn't nurse it, she didn't nurture it, she didn't even look at it. He's over there and saw Miss Emily with little Riker today. Miss Nett was holding little Riker and he popped his eyes open was looking at Miss Nett and Miss Nett handed him to Emily and you should have seen that little boy looking up at his mama. And you should have seen mama looking at that little boy. Uh, there was a love fest going on there without any words being said. That baby's like, oh, that's what you look like, Mama. Huh? And isn't that sweet and wonderful? This Mama don't even look at her baby. Can you imagine the trauma and the heartbreak for a Mama to not even regard her child? And look what she names at verse 21. And she named the child Ichabod saying, The glory is departed from Israel. The glory is departed from Israel. It is terrible, Brother Phil, to think that all that Israel stood for is now gone, and the crowning jewel of Israel has been taken away. And as a result, she says, call this little baby that I don't even regard Ichabod. Now, that's cruel. I mean, it's cruel to call a child a name that's going to stay with him that reminds everybody the ark was taken the day this boy was born. Hmm. The reality set in. I'm sure the day before they was expecting the birth, they're excited. But now everything's been taken away. What a difference a day makes. Amen. You know why you shouldn't spend a day without prayer? Because what a difference a day makes. You know why you shouldn't spend a day without being in the scriptures? Because what a difference a day makes. You know why you ought to not spend a day relaxing? Because what a difference a day makes. Now notice the results in verse 21. The glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory is departed from Israel for the ark of God is taken. I got to thinking about what's taken away when God's glory departs. Our strength is taken away. We know the joy of the Lord's our strength. You know what's wrong with a lot of our Baptist churches? They, they have services, but God's not there. The glory's departed. They're so rigid in their routine, they don't even know God's gone. And there's no joy. Can I say the joy of the Lord's our strength? That gets taken when the glory's gone. Our song gets taken 
They sing songs, but there's no joy behind the song. There's no power behind the song. There's no uh, ministry behind the song. They're just words, and they're singing them just to sing them, but there's nothing behind it because the glory's gone. I thought about the source of fulfillment is taken away. God's peace and God's presence and God's love manifested is all gone when His glory's gone. And guess what? You wouldn't enjoy church either if God was gone. I, I go in some of these churches, and I'm thinking, Lord, have mercy, what's wrong? Well, God's gone. That's what's wrong. Uh, their standards are gone, so they come up with man-made standards. Can I say their stir is gone, so they need something else to stir them. What a sad, sad thing when God is gone. And I'm not going to preach on any of that tonight. I want to look at verse number 1. Verse number 1 says, And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer. And the Philistines pitched in Aphek. Now I got to looking at this and pondering on this and Aphek is where the Philistines pitched. And Aphek is known as a place of strength or stronghold. It is a superior battle position. Aphek was elevated, and they were able to look down upon the Philistine, or uh, upon the Israel, uh, Israelites. And can I say this about Battle. If you've got an elevated position, you've got a hand up on your uh, foe. And can I say this about battle? Uh, it's a whole lot easier to scout out what you're going to do when you can overlook and see where they're at. Uh, and this is a superior battle position. And if you look around tonight... Uh, our enemy looks like they have a superior battle position. Uh, I mean, it looks like the devil's uh, everywhere, uh, and he's working everywhere, uh, and it looks like there's nowhere we can't go that we don't bump into him, and he's got the upper hand. Uh, I, I mean, he's working in the court system. Uh, he's working in the media. He's working in against in our laws. Uh, he's working in our government. Uh, he's working on the job. Uh, he's working in our schools. Uh, he's working everywhere, and even in a lot of places they call themselves churches uh, the devil's working uh, you have these folks on TV tells you you don't need to be saved uh, all you got to do is send your money uh, all you got to do is works uh, and it'll be okay there are many roads that lead to heaven uh, and it seems like the devil's fighting uh, and he's a working uh, and God's people it seems like we're always lagging behind uh, seems like he's always ahead of the game uh, seems like we can never get an upper hand on him uh, seems like we're we're always fighting and pushing the, a ball uphill, uh, and it seems like we never, ever get anywhere. Doesn't it seem that way? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it, it seems like ever since they made a decree that you could no longer have prayer in schools, America's been on a downhill slide. And then all of a sudden they ruled that abortion was legal. Then all of a sudden they ruled that uh, you can't have God in government and you can't have uh, uh, nativity scenes on courthouses anymore and you can't uh, uh, put, display a cross and you can't even put up a Christmas tree anymore uh, and uh, uh, now you got to have Kwanzaa. What in the world is Kwanzaa and what does it have to do with America? But you got to have it, but you can't have a Christmas tree. And I mean it seems like everything that comes along goes against us. In New York City, 9-11 happened, and, and we know it was an act of terrorism, an act of uh, 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 jihadists that uh, sought to bring America down. You know, in New York City, they display a Koran in their public buildings, but you can't display a Bible. In L.A., they're teaching the Koran and Muslim Islam in their schools, but you can't teach Christianity. It just seems like the devil, get, he's got the upper hand everywhere. And no matter what you do, uh, you're looked on like, oh, you're one of them. Uh, you just believe in God, and you believe the Bible. You believe God created everything. You are so weak-minded now to touch. It seems like he's got a superior battle position. 
Doesn't it? Amen. Anybody feel like you're winning against the devil? Amen. But hold on, neighbor. Israel is pitched beside Ebenezer. And Ebenezer simply means the stone of help. The stone of help. Amen. Can I help you with something? Don't feel too bad for Israel because if you read the next chapter, you find everywhere that that ark lands in the land of the Philistines, problems break out. Yeah. All those heathens, every time they get around the ark, God strikes them with disease and death and sickness. And two chapters later, they come and bring the ark back and say, please take it back. Hey, listen, the natural man receiveth not the things of God, neither indeed can he. They're spiritually discerned. Hey, they may think they want our Bible. They may think they want our altars. They may think they want our sanctuaries. But when they come face to face with our God, they can't handle him. And they're glad to give him back to us. But Ebenezer's the stone of help. I want to preach for a few minutes tonight on our rock of help. Amen. Our rock of help. Yeah. The psalmist said in Psalm 33, 20, Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Psalm 40, 17 says, But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh on me. Thou art my help and my deliverer. Make no tarrying, O oh my God. Psalms 46, 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Psalms 121, verse 1 says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help, my help coming from the Lord, which made the heaven and the earth. Hey, I'm glad we got a rock. He's better than the rock of Gibraltar. He's the rock of ages, and his name is Jesus. Hey, hallelujah, I was in the depths of sin and in my depravity. I was in a horrible pit, but the Lord came by my way. Uh, and he reached way down uh, and he pulled me up out of that pit uh, and he set me on a rock uh, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, hey, he established my goings uh, he put praise unto God in my lips uh, he's been my helper uh, he's been my friend uh, he's my rock tonight uh, he's a stone of help uh, no matter how big the enemy looks uh, he's not bigger than our rock uh, hallelujah what a blessing uh, we got a rock of help tonight uh, and I say he helps overcome some things uh, and I say he helps overcome our foes uh, listen we fight three battles uh, we fight against the devil uh, we fight against the world uh, and we fight against the flesh uh, the Philistines are always a picture of the flesh uh, and I want to say in a war against you and in a rage against you and it might be too much for you uh, but it's not too much for our rock. He is able to deliver you tonight. Hey, the devil might be bigger than you, but he's not bigger than our rock. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Hey, the world may seem like it's bigger, but the world's going to be set up fire one day, and we win, hallelujah, because we got a stone of help, hallelujah. He helps overcome our foes. He helps overcome our fears. No spiritual people in the Bible, at one point or other, face fears. John the Baptist in prison began to doubt. I mean, this is the fella that when Mary told Elizabeth, I'm with child and the Holy Ghost has come over me and I'm going to call his name Jesus. John leaped in Elizabeth's womb. I mean, before he come out of the womb, he knew Jesus was Lord. Uh, uh, can I say, uh, 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 at all the family reunions, uh, 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 when John and Jesus be there as boys, uh, uh, John said, whoa, uh, uh, tell me, uh, uh, Lord, uh, what's going to happen next? Uh, and then when John came out of the wilderness, uh, he come out preaching about Jesus. Uh, 
said, there's one greater than me coming after me uh, whose shoes I'm not worthy to unlatch it. Uh, and then when John baptized him, uh, he saw the Spirit of God uh, descend in a form of dove and heard the voice of God said, this is my beloved son uh, and whom I'm well pleased. Uh, it was John that said, behold the Lamb of God which taken away the sins of the world. But then you find John in prison. He's in prison for telling the truth. And Herod didn't even want to put him in prison, but he made a promise. The king couldn't go back on his word. He wasn't supposed to have Herodias. It was unlawful, and John the Baptist told him. And Herodias didn't like it. Never underestimate the scorn of a woman. She didn't like it. Had a little daughter, Salome, go prostitute herself out and dance before the king. It pleased the king. He says, what do you want? As her mother always said, I want the head of John the Baptist on a, ch on a charger. She asked for it, and Herod, it hurt him in his heart. But he asked for the head of John the Baptist. John's down there in prison. He tells his disciple, go ask Jesus, is he the one, or shall we look for another? Listen. Sometimes you'll face something that's a whole lot bigger than you, and you'll begin to fret and wonder if God still hears your prayers. Wonder if God cares. Wonder if God knows where you're at. Friend, he's in you and you're in him. Of course he knows where you're at. <laughs> you're in his hand. His hand's in the Father's hand. He knows where you're at. <laughs> uh, I want to help you with something. Uh, our rock uh, is able to overcome your fears. Uh, 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 quit looking at your problems. Quit looking at your situation. Go, quit looking at your prison cell uh, and look a little higher. Uh, looking unto Jesus, the author, finish of our faith. Uh, you'll find help from the glory world, uh, and he'll help you overcome your fears. Uh, you know when your fears overcome you? When you dwell on your fear. I want to help you something. When your fear has you, you're in trouble. But when you learn to give that fear to Jesus and tell him, Lord, this is way too big for me, but it's not too big for you. And so, Lord, if you'd move on this thing, I sure would be happy and pleased to let you have it. And friends, when you look unto Jesus, he's able to overcome your fears. He's a stone of help, friends. He's your Ebenezer. And I say this. He helps us overcome our falls. Won't be long, little Riker will start walking. Huh? You watch little Hannah. Boy, she gets after it. But when she first starts, she'd take a few steps, she'd hit the she'd hit the ground. Isn't it good babies bounce? They hit the ground, boom. We hit the ground, things crack. They just bounce back up. You know, long before they Walk that first mile, they've fallen a many a times. But can I say, same thing happens with baby Christians. You start walking in the newness of life, and you're subject to fall. And you're subject to fall again. And you're subject to fall again. And you're subject to fall again. But he'll help you overcome your falls. The problem is, after you've been saved 30 years, and you're still wearing diapers, sucking on milk, that's a problem. That still happens with Christians. They've been saved a long time, but they're still baby Christians, and they're still subject to fall. But he'll over, help you overcome your faults. Hmm? He'll get you on the meat. Amen. You need to be on meat to strengthen your bones. So if you fall, you don't crack. He'll help you overcome your falls. He helps us overcome our fractures. Amen. If you've ever been in this thing long enough, Somewhere along the way, your, your subject gets shattered. Somebody will step on your heart. You're trying to live for God, trying to do right, trying to help folks. Somebody take advantage of you and break your heart. If you've been in this thing long enough, you've seen problems in church. Breaks your heart for church. You come to worship, and then there's junk goes on, and it affects your worship got news our stone of help can help us overcome those fractures because if you let them fractures stay splintered bitterness will set in you better get to Ebenezer he can fix your fractures and look like there's never been a problem he's able to do it friend I've seen him do it in my life 
And you better be careful saying, I'll never. He's liable to make you eat that so he can fix your fracture. Mm. Our rock of help helps us to overcome our fading, our drifting. You know, sometimes as a pastor, one of the most tragic things, you watch folks start to drift. They're not what they used to be. And in love, you go and you try and talk to them about it, and then they get indignant and get mad. Well, who are you judging me? I'm not judging you. I can just see it. The Bible does say that the overseer, the man of God, watches for your souls. And you can see folks drifting. You can see them going down the wrong path. And try to help them. Try to recover them. You're not judging them. You're not indicting them. You're just concerned. And they get mad. That's always a tale, tale, tall tale sign that they're not in the will of God. When a man of God comes to you and says, hey, I'm concerned about you, you ought to be thankful. Sure. When they get bad, that lets me know there's something wrong in their heart. You see, our stone of help, he helps us overcome our fading, our drifting. He knows just how far to let you go, and then he jerks a knot in your tail and get you back to where you should have been all along. So if you're not careful, you'll drift. You can drift sitting on a church pew. You can drift sitting singing in the choir. You can drift standing behind the pulpit. You can drift. And all it takes is taking the ark for granted. Well, it's always going to be there. That's what Eli thought. He helps overcome our fading. He helps overcome our faithlessness. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. The reason we don't have revival is not much faith. Our faith's in our abilities. Our faith's in our bank account. Our faith is in our jobs. Our faith is in our teams. Our faith is in a lot of things. It's not in Jesus. Amen. Say, preacher, how can you say that? Because all it takes is a little bit to happen in one of them things you're banking on and you go to pieces. But when your faith's in Jesus, I'm not saying it won't affect you if something goes wrong, but it won't destroy you. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like this. How many people's ever rode on an elevator? Anybody never rode on an elevator? Anybody got a phobia of elevators? I wouldn't want to get stuck in one, but I'm not afraid God would get on them all the time. If you've ever been in a crew tower and take that one up to the 45th floor, that's kind of scary. You get there in about 12 seconds. It's got a jet engine underneath it. And then you get out and you get in this other one to go up the next three or four flights, and that thing's a death trap. Huh? But here's the whole problem with an elevator. It's hung on one cable. If something happens to that cable, you're in trouble. And that's what happens when you put your stock in anything other than Jesus. You're stocking on that one cable. See, when you put your faith in the Lord, you've got, you got three cables. You've got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and neither one of them have ever broken or ever lost anything. I'd much rather have them three hold me up than one fragile thing that some fellow by the name of Elmer checks it out once every three years and gives them a piece of paper that it's okay. Hmm? Isn't it sad that you put more faith in Elmer that that elevator is going to get you where you need to be than you do in Jesus? You're welcome. Huh? Somebody in here is related to somebody named Elmer. You're thinking about him right now. And you know I'm telling you the truth. Uh, when Elmer's got one eyebrow, you know he's an elevator man. Our Ebenezer helps us to overcome our flaunting. Helps us overcome our flaunting, our boasting, our arrogance. God resisted the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You know what else he doesn't like? He doesn't like false humility. He don't want you acting like you're humble when you're not humble. That makes him want to humble you even quicker. Hmm? Who are we? that God 
would even take notice of us. But when we get to pounding our chest thinking we're something when we're nothing, the Bible says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh that he standeth take heed lest he fall. But he'll help us overcome our flaunting, our arrogance, our boasting. We are what we are. Only, as Brother Sidney said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Outside of his grace, we're nothing. But somehow we get to thinking we're something. And that God can't do this thing without us. Hmm? I remind you of what he told Job. He said, where was you when I hung the stars out there? Where was you when I created this? Where was you when I created that? Where was you? Hmm? We're nothing. God help us to remember that. We have a stone of help that will. See, when the stone of help, when you're anchored in him, you got your sights on him, you realize you're nothing. That's why John said he must increase and I must decrease. He'll help us overcome our frostbite. If you're not, not careful, you get cold. Amen. You can get cold over a lot of things. You can get cold over trials, tragedies, trauma. Make you cold. You get your heart ripped out, guess what? You don't want to put your heart back out there no more. You get cold. You can get cold because your prayers aren't being answered, but it seems like everybody else's is. You can get cold. God, how long must I wait? Well, however long it takes. God's long suffering. God's a working, whether or not we see Him working or not. You know what else will make you cold? People. I'm going to be honest with you, there are some days I'd like to live on an island where it's just me and my family and Swiss rolls. Yeah. No, I could live with that day. You couldn't, but I could. Yeah. Sometimes people drive you crazy. Brother Greg Phillips says, slowest form of suicide is pastor in a Baptist church. But you know what? Working where you work. Putting up with people. Being on a freeway, having to deal with people. Hmm? Watching the news and having to deal with people. Just putting up with people. Of course you get cold. See, when we see people get on their nerves, it ought to cause us to have compassion for them because they don't know any better. Hmm. But a lot of times it, it makes us become hard towards people. We get cold because we're tired of dealing with people. Hmm. I don't mind people. I, I don't like ignorant people. Now, I didn't say uneducated people. I said ignorant people. People that have the means to be educated and they choose not to be. They choose to be ignorant. I have a real problem with ignorance. I mean, everybody's got the internet. There's no reason to be ignorant. Huh? People choose to be ignorant. I have a real problem with that. I have a real problem with ignorant people that come to church and want to make themselves look out to be something they're not. If anybody had ever realized that Solomon told us when people open their mouths, they reveal really what they are. It amazes me how some people want to sound so spiritual, and yet they're so ignorant. It's like, shut up. You drive me nuts. There are people that way. There are preachers that way. Huh? You want to say, sit down, shut up. And that'll get on your nerves, and that'll make you cold. Instead of having compassion, say, Lord, you've got to help them people because they're in a mess. Hmm? And then say, Lord, but by the grace of God, there goeth I. Yeah. Yeah. See, people can make you get cold. See, he'll help us with our frostbite. Because see, all you got to do is stay in your book and keep your eyes on him, and all of a sudden he'll show it's only by his grace that's not you. Let me say this lastly. He'll help us overcome our feebleness. 
not feeble from not having strength, feeble from being ineffective. It bothers me that all these non-churches are growing in leaps and bounds and having 47 services on a weekend and they, they're building millions of dollars of buildings and they're paid for and they're doing all this stuff and they don't have the truth. That bothers me. And we can't even get our own members to come back on Sunday night. Now that might not bother you, but that bothers me. It makes me feel like I'm not very effective. It bothers me when people enjoy the things of the world more than they enjoy the Lord, but yet they claim they know Him and they love Him. That bothers me. It bothers me when you can preach the truth and people let it go in one ear and out the other and don't care and never apply it to their life. Right. It bothers me when you can stand up and say, this is what God says, and people say, who cares? It makes me feel that I'm ineffective and I get feeble. And then God will remind me that he's Ebenezer. And he'll say, they didn't listen to Jeremiah. Yeah. They didn't listen to Isaiah. They didn't listen to Ezekiel. They didn't listen to Daniel. They didn't listen to Hosea. They didn't listen to Micah. And more than all those, they didn't listen to Jesus. They didn't listen to me. You just keep doing what you're supposed to do and I'll help you all along the way. Yes, the enemy is at Aphek. And the enemy looks like he's winning. Read the back of the book. Ebenezer stands strong and all others bow before his feet. He is our Ebenezer. He's our stone of help. Quit looking at the enemy and stay at Ebenezer and you'll see what a great help you'll be in every battle you face again they get the ark back and then something greater happens Eli's off the scene and now Samuel becomes the high priest and he's the greatest high priest that Israel will ever know God uses Samuel to anoint David the greatest king that Israel will ever know and God does a great work in Israel after they get the ark back. As a matter of fact, when chapter 4 transpires where Israel's pitch wasn't called Ebenezer then, it's Samuel who names it Ebenezer a few chapters later, and when he's inspired to pin it down, he goes ahead and calls it by the name that he called it a couple chapters later. Why? Because long before you ever knew he existed, God was already there, and he's already looking out for you. Can I say he's always been a stone of help? Good. And so, friend, maybe it's got a little cold in your heart. Maybe you've got a little fear in your heart. Maybe you're struggling a little bit, and maybe you even feel like the glory's departed and you've fallen. I've got good news. We've got a stone of help. And all you've got to do is put your trust in him, and the glory shows back up, and he does great and mighty things which you know it's not. But it all comes back to yielding to him. The glory don't have to depart. But if it has departed, Ebenezer still stands today. And he'll still help you. And he'll bring back the glory to your life. If you'll open your heart and let him in. My prayer for you is to get to Ebenezer. You'll find all the help you need to overcome anything you'll face. And you'll find that he is the rock of ages that never, ever changes. And he's a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. Maybe tonight you just need to get your eyes back on him. Our Ebenezer, his name is Jesus, and he'll help your life. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. Some are already praying. We have a stone of help tonight, and he'll help you, friend, if you're willing to give him complete control of your heart and your life. As they're picking our song, let's pray. Father, we sure do love you. Thank you for being a present help in time of trouble. Thank you, Lord. We can always look to you and find the direction we need. God, give us the strength, Lord, to just trust you and depend on you. 
Lord, I pray that the glory never depart, but if there's some that it's waned, I pray that, Lord, they'll get back to Ebenezer and find the glory just as rich and sweet as it once was. Now, Father, do a work around here. Touch hearts and lives. And God, help us to go forth from this place victorious, not in our own strength or ability, but in our helper, the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless now. Bless in this invitation. Speak to hearts. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.